Hi everyone, I'm Lara Brown, Women's Officer at the Cambridge Union. Thank you so much for tuning in to this virtual event today. We are absolutely delighted to be hosting Professor Peter Singer to the Cambridge Union. Professor Singer is the Ira W. DeCamp Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University and Laureate Professor at the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at the University of Melbourne. His book, Animal Liberation, published in 1975, is recognised as seminal work of animal ethics, and he's been an outspoken defender of veganism. Of course, it does go without saying that in extending an invitation to a speaker, we at the Cambridge Union do not take a position on their views. Professor Singh is probably the most significant and influential utilitarian thinker alive today, so it is an, it is an honour to have him with, um, with us, albeit virtually. For the format of the event, Professor Singh is going to make some opening remarks and then I'll ask him some questions. The chat will be open on the live stream throughout the talk, and I encourage anyone to posit questions they have there. Um, Professor Singh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lara, and uh, thank you for everybody at the Cambridge Union who's helped to organise uh, this event. Uh, I'm very happy to be speaking at Cambridge, um, by Zoom, obviously, but uh, I associate Cambridge with the great 19th century utilitarian philosopher, Henry Sidgwick. Um, I know there's still a Sidgwick Avenue at Cambridge. Um, he's he's honoured there, and uh, he's somebody who I regard as, as perhaps the clearest and most careful of the great 19th century utilitarian thinkers. Uh, that includes Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, also great thinkers, but I think Sidgwick was uh, probably the best of them uh, as, a, as a philosopher, the one who was most careful and thought through uh, best. And his book, The Methods of Ethics, is uh, still, I think, one of the best, if not the best, works available in ethics. So um, as Lara said, I'm going to speak just for a, a relatively short time to go over some of the key ideas and things that I've been thinking about. And then I want to give you plenty of time to ask questions and hopefully have a discussion of things that you want to pick up. Let me start with what I was just talking about, my utilitarianism. Uh, for those not familiar with it, utilitarianism is the view that the right action is the action of all the possibilities open to you that will have the best consequences. And by best consequences, utilitarians mean uh, do the most to improve the welfare or the well being of everyone affected by your actions. On balance, obviously, every action is going to have some downsides for some um, and upsides for others. So it's the net surplus, as the classical utilitarians put it, the net, net surplus of happiness over misery uh, that you're looking to produce, the, the greatest possible net surplus. So um, why do I hold this view? Uh, essentially, I like the fact that this is a somewhat down to earth view. It tells us to do something that we're all interested in. I think uh, everybody is interested in um, increasing their happiness or their well-being, or uh, having more of their preferences met and minimizing their pain and suffering and, uh, and distress. So uh, that's one thing that I like about it. Uh, another thing that I like about it is that it's, um, I, th I think it's, it's, there are a lot of objections put to it, but I think that utilitarians have good responses to those objections. And uh, we can probably discuss some of those objections. I imagine you will ask me questions about that when we come to question time. But uh, as compared with many other views, I think that uh, it is fairly clear what utilitarianism tells us to do. Um, often people who put forward alternative ethical views uh, will talk about um, things that are, are vague and hard to see um, exactly what they imply. Uh, they talk about respecting rights, but then of course we can discuss what rights we have and we'll get, immediately get into difficult disagreements about what rights we have and what they mean. Uh, we can talk about um, treating everybody as an end and not a means as Kant talks about, but uh, again, what exactly does that mean? And if we do take it 
reasonably, literally, it seems to prevent us doing things that could uh, prevent a great deal of harm. So uh, I think we shouldn't be locked into views that tell us that even though we could, let's say, see a lot of innocent people being killed, we can't do that because that would be using perhaps one person as a means. Um, and that's absolutely prohibited on uh, some Kantian views. So um, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that in general, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the applied areas that I've spent a, a lot of my working life thinking and writing about. Uh, Lara already mentioned my book, Animal Liberation, and I do want to say something about that and the views that I put forward there. I also uh, have written about global poverty and what we ought to do about that. And that's another question that I want to touch on. And then I think uh, we should say something about climate change, uh, which I see as one of the great moral challenges of the 21st century and one that so far we're not looking like meeting. So that's uh, an important issue and uh, I'll touch on that too. So just briefly then these uh, three topics. In animal liberation, I put forward the view that our treatment of animals uh, is uh, essentially based on speciesism. That is a prejudice uh, against beings who are not members of our species. And obviously the use of that term, which I didn't invent, it was invented by a man called Richard Ryder, who I knew when I was a graduate student at Oxford. Um, uh, speciesism is intended to suggest an analogy with other isms that we, most people do now reject. Uh, racism, of course, we've seen huge protests just in the last few days. Uh, emphasizing the rejection of racism, but uh, we didn't need those protests to know that most decent people do reject racism, uh, certainly at the level of rhetoric, maybe not everybody at the level of practice, unfortunately. Um, and then, and sexism uh, uh, is another uh, ism that we, most people would say uh, we would reject. But uh, while it's barely possible in uh, polite society to come out overtly as a racist or a sexist, it certainly still is uh, to be a speciesist. Uh, and that's, um, I think, part of the uh, reflection of the difficulty of getting people to change their thinking about animals. Now, sometimes people take this rejection of speciesism to, uh, as if it implies that we have to treat humans and non-human animals in as equally in the sense of the same. Obviously that's not the case. And I don't think the rejection of speciesism implies that it is the case. It doesn't even imply, I think that uh, somebody said to me in a recent discussion that if we have a choice between rescuing uh, uh, a human or an animal from a building that uh, we should toss a coin. Uh, I don't think any of those things follow. What does follow is that where we have uh, beings with similar interests, for example, the interest in not feeling pain, and uh, there's no reason to think that the pain of one is greater than the other or that there'll be greater long-term consequences than the other, then uh, we should not discriminate against uh, beings on the grounds that they're not members of our species. So uh, the pain of a human child and the pain of uh, a dog or a cat or a pig or a chicken, any being who we can be confident is feeling pain, um, can't the same. Similar amounts of pain can't equally. And what that means is that we shouldn't impose some uh, severe amount of pain or suffering on an animal unless it's the only way to avoid um, an equal or greater uh, amount of pain for others. Uh, and really, I think I should have said uh, a greater amount of pain. If it's equal, there's no particular reason to impose it on one rather than the other. 
but that is exactly what we do, I believe, in very common practices with animals, um, most obviously in factory farming, which uh, confines uh, tens of billions of animals. Uh, right now around the world, there are tens of billions of animals in factory farms. Um, they are very crowded. They are not given conditions that are suitable for their nature or their social needs. Um, and uh, they have to endure these conditions for essentially the length of their life or most of the length of their life. Uh, and um, until eventually they're slaughtered. Now, what do we get out of this? Well, basically I think what we get out of it is uh, food, uh, the taste of which pleases us. Um, I don't think you could really argue that we get more than that out of it. We, um, obviously we do get food that nourishes us, but we can get food that nourishes us without using animals. Um, we can, there's been an increasing swing to plant-based foods in the last few years. And I think it's now well known that you can live a healthy life on a vegan diet. Uh, and that in fact, a vegan diet is also more efficient in terms of land use and in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we have good reasons not to use animal products, but if we do it, it's simply responding to the market demand that is there. And as I say, that market demand is largely anyway, um, a matter of people wanting a certain kind of taste for their food. So this seems to me to be a, a classic example of speciesism, um, forcing animals to endure uh, horrible lives for weeks or months, depending on the species we're talking about, in or because we then enjoy the taste of that meal that we eat for uh, whatever it is, half an hour, an hour. Um, it's, uh, I think it's something that we cannot defend and cannot justify. And I focus on that rather than many of the other abuses we inflict on animals because in terms of numbers, that really dwarfs um, the others. Well, the only one that it doesn't dwarf in terms of numbers, I think, is uh, what we do to fish who we catch in the wild, we don't inflict bad lives on them, um, but we kill them without any kind of uh, uh, anesthetic or, or rendering them unconscious painlessly as we should do with um, land animals. And, and the numbers are even larger than the numbers of animals in factory farms. So uh, that's the view that I put forward in Animal Liberation, which is now um, published 45 years ago. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion and debate, but um, I'm encouraged by the increasing number of people who are moving away from animal foods and uh, the increasing support for the idea that animals have rights, broadly speaking. You, you might say, how as a utilitarian do I say that animals have rights? Utilitarians don't even think that humans have rights. Um, but I think we can use that uh, broadly to say that there are certain things that it's wrong to do to animals that we ought to have laws protecting animals against. Uh, and in that uh, broad popular sense, rather than in a strict philosophical sense, I think it's fine to say that the movement we're talking about is uh, an animal rights movement. Let me move from that to uh, global poverty. Uh, this is another issue that I uh, wrote about um, more than 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, my interest at that time was to try to argue that uh, we, that is those of us living in uh, material comfort, whether in affluent countries or in middle income countries, or even uh, for among the few wealthy in low income countries, those of us who have more than we need to meet uh, basic needs, um, have an obligation to be doing something to assist people who are less fortunate than us uh, living in extreme poverty. And uh, to, to make that point, I used uh, a little story which has since become famous uh, and associated with me, uh, the story of the, the child in the shallow pond. So I ask you to imagine that you're walking across a park that uh, this park has a pond in it uh, 
you know this pond is quite shallow because in summer you've seen kids playing in it and for a teenager it's only waist deep uh, but uh, it's not summer now you don't expect to see anybody playing in the pond but when you look at the pond you do see something splashing in the pond and when you look more closely to your surprise you see that it's a very small child too small to stand in even in this shallow pond and obviously floundering around and in imminent danger of drowning. So your next thought would be, uh, who's looking after this child? Where's the parent or the babysitter? They must be about to jump in and help the child. But no, there's nobody else there in the park. Uh, so then you think, okay, um, this child's gonna drown unless I run down and pull the child out of the pond, I better do that. But suppose now you have a somewhat more selfish thought and you think, ah, oh, just today I'm going somewhere special and I put on my most expensive shoes and uh, expensive clothing. Uh, that's all gonna get ruined if I jump into this muddy pond um, and I'm gonna be up for a significant expense. I can afford it, but you know, I don't like the cost of replacing these, some of my best clothes. So suppose that you do have that thought and you then think, well, do I have an obligation to rescue this child? It's not my child. Nobody asked me to look after the child, never seen the child before. I certainly didn't push the child in the pond or anything horrible like that. So why don't I just forget that I ever saw the child and, and walk on my way where I'm going, not be put to the expense of replacing my shoes. Well, I've asked many audiences uh, what they would think of such a person and uh, overwhelmingly, virtually unanimously, they say that would be a horrible thing to do. You can't put your clothes, no matter how expensive, above the life of a child. So somebody who did that, walked on, left the child to drown, would be an awful kind of person. But now let's go back to thinking about our obligations for people in extreme poverty. We are not powerless to help them. There are organizations independently audited and verified as effective that are helping people in extreme poverty. There are organizations like, for example, the Against Malaria Foundation, which provides bed nets to families living in malaria prone regions and malaria is a major killer of children, um, particularly young children who die from malaria. Of course, it's a nasty disease for everybody who gets it, but it's a killer mostly of children. So by donating to the Against Malaria Foundation, you can save a child's life. Now, you can't just give one bed net and be sure you've saved a child's life. You have to give quite a few because obviously not all bed nets save a life, but, uh, um, you could probably save up and do it. Uh, it might be a couple of thousand dollars, so maybe a bit more than you'd spend on shoes, but um, something that you can do or that you can get together with other people and do. Um, now, if you don't do that, if you know this, that you could do that and you don't do it, are you really all that different from the person who doesn't save the drowning child because they don't want to go to the expense of buying new clothing. Uh, psychologically, of course, it's different. If the child is not in front of you, you can't see who's in need of your help. Uh, you just can know that this organization is saving lives. And if I increase the resources available to them, they'll save more lives. So psychologically, yes, I grant it's different. But morally, I don't really think it is very different morally. I don't think the fact that you can't see the child or that the child is at some distance from you really makes a big difference. What's important is that you can save a child's life or for that matter, you can improve people's lives by preventing them becoming blind or restoring sight in people who are blind. Lots of things that you can do quite inexpensively uh, where you're doing a lot more good than you're harming yourself. And in those circumstances, again, isn't that something we ought to be doing? Can we really think that we're living an ethical life if we are not um, doing something to help people who through no fault of their own are in much greater need than we are and 
uh, quite possibly uh, watching their child die from a disease that could be prevented uh, or um, in other ways living a life that is beneath the minimal level that we think is acceptable for human beings to live. So that's the, the second uh, issue. The, th the third issue that I want to talk about, as I said, is climate change. And um, climate change also relates to uh, loss of life and uh, to great hardship, uh, because we know that the science is telling us that our greenhouse gas emissions are heating up the planet. We know that if we don't get to a carbon neutral state in a relatively short time, and the estimates vary, some people say as soon as 2025, uh, others go out to something like 2045. But um, within that sort of time frame, uh, if we don't get to a carbon neutral state, then we will pass the two degrees Celsius uh, rise in global temperatures, which will mean that various feedback loops will start to cut in and uh, climate change is likely to get out of control and quite catastrophic by which it mean, I mean that uh, there could well be hundreds of millions or even billions of people who become climate refugees uh, and many of them who can't make it and who don't survive, others who endure great hardship and do survive. So this time, uh, this is not happening to um, people far away from us geographically, but it's happening to people in the future who, again, we're not seeing now. Um, of course, it's, it's happening to some extent to people right now as well. We're having more intense storms and hurricanes. We're having more intense floods. Uh, in Australia, where I am now in, in January, we had more intense bushfires than we've ever seen after a very dry, hot spell. Uh, so it is happening now, but um, the consequences for many more people will lie some years in the future. Uh, I think, again, we have a, a strong moral obligation to do something about this. Uh, again, it can be something personal, as with changing what we eat. I've already mentioned for the sake of animals, but um, changing what we eat in order to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, avoiding animal products for that reason, is also something we can do. Reducing fossil fuel use is uh, something else we can do. And I think we should be doing these things. Um, to set an example uh, of how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to try to play less of a role ourselves in what's happening. But uh, here, and I think there's something of a contrast with global poverty in that I think it is essential here for governments to take steps. In global poverty, it's, it's good if governments increase foreign aid and do it as effectively as possible and target it at the poorest of the poor, which they don't always do. Um, but we can make a huge impact just as individuals if we really give to effective non-government organizations. Whereas with climate change, I fear that even if those of us who are well-intentioned uh, do cut our greenhouse gas emissions, we're not going to get to the carbon neutrality target fast enough um, because I don't think enough people are going to be doing that in the near future unless governments do things to encourage them. And those things could obviously include a carbon tax or a cap and trade scheme uh, or subsidies for clean energy, uh, uh, a whole variety of, of different measures that governments are aware of. And some of them are starting to implement on a small scale, but not nearly enough. So here, I think there is an, an ethical obligation to be politically active, to be involved in trying to elect politicians with strong platforms on greenhouse, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and to try to make uh, more people aware of this. So um, I think that taking part in uh, political actions, in uh, nonviolent uh, protest actions, including civil disobedience, can be justified in the light of the seriousness of this enormous problem and the fact that at present, we don't seem to be on track to meet the targets required to avoid the catastrophic consequences.
So I'm going to stop at, uh, at that point. I think I've gone uh, roughly the kinds of time that I thought I would, maybe a few minutes over, but uh, I know it, it leads, uh, leaves us uh, a little more than half an hour for questions and discussion. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, all of you and of course from you, Lara, as well. Thank you so much for those really fascinating and opening remarks. Before we move on to sort of discussing them and pulling questions from the live stream, I wanted to give you the chance to respond to something. Um, our student union, to which we aren't affiliated, released a statement a few days ago stating that the actively opposed this event encourages all not to attend nor interact with the Facebook event at all. Continue to offer Peter Singer a platform and an audience has only legitimize his harmful views he holds and shares. This was, of course, in reference to abuse and disability and infanticide. How would you respond to their calls for a boycott? Well, I think that uh, we ought not to boycott people because we disagree with them or ask people to, to de-platform them. I think we ought to uh, attend the events and try to show why we disagree with them. I think that's the way to make progress. Um, I don't think that uh, preventing people from speaking helps us to understand the issues. Um, I think the people who wrote that should go back and read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. Um, in particular, I like Mill's arguments that if we, uh, even if we're right about our views and even if the speaker is wrong, uh, as perhaps I am wrong on the disability issue, um, if we don't allow our views to be challenged, they just become a, a dead dogma. Um, we don't really think about the reasons for them and uh, when they, if they are challenged, we don't really know how to reply. So I congratulate the Cambridge Union on encouraging free speech and free debate. Um, I think that's a, an essential part of a university's role. And it's disappointing to me that university students should turn their back on that. Thanks so much for your response. I'm really grateful that we, we have an answer to that. And I wanted to start with a discussion of your questions about speciesism. And here I'm going to pull a question from the live stream from Ruth. Um, Ruth asks, if we were to have reason to believe that animals enjoy their lives more than humans, um, ought we to prioritise the preferences of animals over that of humans? Yes, um, I, I suppose if we really had reason to believe that that was the case, uh, that would be something we ought to do. It's, um, it's, it's an example that the uh, American, uh, late American philosopher Robert Nozick put forward some years ago. He um, asked us to imagine a utility monster, as he called it. So a utility monster was an imaginary being who could get vastly greater utility out of life than, um, than anyone else can. Uh, and Nozick suggested that if that were the case, then utilitarians would have to sacrifice themselves, assume that for some reason the utility monster needed their, our sacrifice. We, we would have to sacrifice ourselves in order to keep the utility monster going because the utility monster would get so much more utility. Um, now, you know, this is one of these hypothetical examples that are often put against utilitarians. Um, and uh, I think the right utilitarian response to say is, well, if you show me that that's true, that there is such a monster, then yes, you know, that's what I should do. Maybe I'll be too selfish to do it when it comes to the crunch, but um, that would be the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, as far as we know, there are no utility monsters. And I'm also uh, skeptical of the factual claim that uh, I know you weren't really making it. You were, it was a hy hypothetical one again, or, or uh, uh, the question I was making, uh, that animals do have uh, greater capacities for enjoying their lives than we do. That's really interesting. And in the remit of sort of practically what we accept in, in a world where we do think that humans have sort of greater pleasure from their lives than animals. What are your thoughts? I know you're a committed vegetarian and vegan. But what are your thoughts on using rats for scientific or research purposes? So I'm not an absolutist uh, in opposition to experiments on animals because I'm a utilitarian. I don't think a utilitarian can be an absolutist on this issue. Um, so if uh, somebody describes an experiment where um, there will be some harm done to a limited number of animals, and I have to say, you know, you chose rats, which I suppose more people would say, yes, let's do it. Um, but I think I would have to say the same if this was dogs or, or cats or something that people are more attracted to. Um, if something were to uh, inflict a uh, 
uh, and, and some harm on a limited amount of number of them. Um, and of course, we take every possible step we can to minimize that harm, consistent with the objective of the research. Um, but the objective of the research is sufficiently important that uh, it would create much larger benefits to either dogs and rats or to humans, uh, doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned, um, then I think that would justify uh, the experiment. Um, so that's why I'm not an absolutist. Maybe there are some experiments like this that uh, can be done in this way and that we couldn't find this out in any other way. Uh, then, okay, that can be the right thing to do. But the problem now is that, of course, we don't, because we're speciesist, we don't require that kind of equivalence. We're very ready to do all sorts of experiments on animals where th there's no necessity for doing it. Um, and the benefit is not great. And it might be something like testing new household products. Um, I think the European Union now has stopped the cosmetic testing on animals, but that went on until a few years ago. But there are still other household products that are not medical life-saving drugs that get tested on animals in, in painful ways. And uh, you know, that's just one example of the kind of research that I think we should be doing. Okay, is there something happened to the internet? I'm not uh, hearing anything. Sorry, could you just rephrase the last bit of that? I think the connection cut out. The connection went out. Um, so the last bit of what I was saying was that uh, I think that m most of the experiments that we do today uh, are not judged by a sufficiently non-species standard. That is, uh, we are not giving equal consideration to the interest of the animals in, in not suffering pain uh, uh, as, as we would give to humans in those circumstances. And so we do experiments for things that we don't really need, um, like testing household products that are not necessities. Uh, and I, you know, that's, that's what I would like to put a stop to. And maybe when we'd done that, we very carefully examined all of the experiments, there might still be some that would be justified on utilitarian on non-speciesist utilitarian grounds, but they would be a, a small fraction of, of what we're doing now. You've spoken a lot about, in, in the context of testing products, a sort of utilitarian balance of, of balance, um, utilitarian balancing of, of preferences and benefits. Um, on that note exactly, Elise from the live streams asked, where do you stand on the eating of edible insects as a very cheap and sustainable food source in Asia and Africa? Yes, um, the, the difficulty with the question about where I stand on eating edible insects is um, that obviously it raises the question, do insects feel pain? Um, are they conscious beings or not? Uh, and that's a question in which it's really hard to give um, a firm answer either way. Uh, and, you know, I... I you could suggest that uh, they don't, that they have too few neurons, um, uh, that uh, their behavior is more robotic, uh, that it doesn't make sense to postulate that they're conscious beings. But there are now starting to be some people who study these questions who are saying, well, that's not so clear. Um, it's quite possible that they are. Uh, in fact, there's a journal called Animal Sentience, which just published an article um, just in the last few days, uh, arguing this. And people are interested, I suggest go and have a look at uh, Animal Sentience and uh, you'll find that it's an open access uh, journal, so it's not hard to find. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm a bit hesitant. Uh, if I were convinced that the uh, insects were not conscious, uh, then fine. If that's an efficient way of producing protein, very good. Um, but by the way, when we talk about insects, we're talking about a vast and diverse range of beings. And it's quite possible that some of them, let's say, you know, some of this, I know protein production is being done with mealworms. Well, maybe mealworms are not conscious, but some of it is being done with crickets. Maybe crickets are conscious. Um, we can't really just lump them all together and say, well, we know that none of them are conscious. Uh, and of course, if they are conscious, then there's questions about what are they experiencing? There's very many of them. Uh, if each one is a center of consciousness, it starts to add up. So, um, 
that's why I'm, you know, I, th I think it's, it's, it's better and safer to uh, avoid insects where there's significant doubt about their consciousness. So a lot of your utilitarianism seems to boil down into sort of what we don't know and we can't make sort of firm decisions so we know who feels consciousness and who doesn't feel pain. So do you feel that there's a moral burden on people in Africa and Asia who sort of need food sources to avoid insects, say, well, we don't have the evidence. To, to, would you argue that we should ease the side of caution? Well, um, I'm not going to say to anyone who is struggling to get enough food for their family or, or struggling to get enough protein to bring up healthy children, uh, I'm not going to say to them, you shouldn't be eating this or that. Um, I think that you know, that's an unreasonable demand to put on anyone. And I know that in those circumstances, uh, I would eat no doubt, or, or uh, get from my children, uh, probably not only insects, but um, other, other animals that I could. So I think what we should be doing is looking at what we're doing. We have these choices uh, and we can control what we eat. Um, and you know, perhaps at some future time when the world is more prosperous and it's easier for pe other people who are now in poverty to have those choices, then will be the time to say, look, you don't need to eat this. Um, your children don't need to eat this. So let's give the animals the benefit of the doubt when we can. And uh have a healthy plant-based diet moving on now to your um sh child in a shallow pond example that you spoke about earlier um i don't know if you know this but last term the union hosted toby ord who whose theory of effective altruism is obviously very greatly inspired by your own work in applied ethics how do you think our students can aspire to more effective altruists and do you think that effective altruism is culturally specific to western scientific types or do you think the conservatives and non-Westerners would be attracted to your philosophy? Well, it's certainly not confined to Westerners. Um, there are uh, effective altruism groups all over the world. Um, and uh, that is not just the Western world. There are groups in places like uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, my uh, book, The Most Good You Can Do, has been translated into Chinese and being published on uh, uh, and. Uh, the People's Republic of China. Um, I've spoken about effective altruism to uh, groups in, in uh, Kazakhstan, for example. Um, so it is it is a worldwide movement. Um, does it particularly appeal to scientific types, which of course are not limited to the West? Well, I think it appeals to maybe a bit to people who think uh, quantitatively, that is who are uh, thinking about the numbers and the fact that uh, you can help to help more people is better than helping fewer people. Uh, but that doesn't take any particular uh, high skills. So uh, I think it's I think it's generally quite broad in its appeal. And I'm glad to see the way that it has been spreading around the world in the last 10 years. I want to move now on to um, what you said about climate change. I found that particularly fascinating in the utilitarian framework. You seem to really prioritizing future lives um, in discussion of climate change and people that aren't born yet. We've had a question from the live stream from David about how your ethical framework gives moral weight to future beings in the context of climate change, but not necessarily when you're, re um, you're rectifying a pro-choice movement. So how would you sort of balance those two views? Uh, I think there are different issues uh, here. I, um, I'm concerned about future lives that will be lived um, or that can be lived. Um, so uh, what I'm worried about with climate change is that there are people who are going to be living who will be experiencing um, a planet that is more difficult to live in. Uh, there are people, maybe some of them, of course, as I said, are alive now, but some of them are not yet born, um, who will become refugees because the rains fail, let's say they're subsistence farmers and the rains fail um, because of climate change and they simply can't grow food where they and their uh, ancestors have been living for a long time. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of suffering and premature death because of that. Now, um, if we can prevent that, then the fact that it's in the future, I think doesn't make it any less serious. 
uh, maybe it makes it a little less certain, but uh, if we apply some kind of uncertainty discount, which wouldn't be very great if we're talking about 50 years in the future, um, then I think we should give equal weight to them. Um, you referred to my views about the pro-choice movement. Um, so if uh, we're talking about, let's say, uh, a woman who's done pregnant, is considering term the pregnancy, um, then there will be no life who will be lived, who will be suffering because of that. There will simply not be that particular life. And I'm hoping that the abortion is being performed early. I think the uh, feed is not sentient at the time when most abortions are performed. If we're talking about an abortion very late in pregnancy, sort of six months or after, then I think there is some concern about the possible infliction of pain on the fetus. But um, but uh, I don't think that it's a good thing in the world today to bring more people into existence. I think that um, arguably we either have or will have in uh, another 50 or so years as many people as the planet can sustainably support. And uh, I don't we should encourage people to have more children. So I see the decision to end the pregnancy uh, not that different in terms of its impact on future life as the decision not to become pregnant in the first place. In other words, to use contraception. Um, the result of both of them is that there is a life that will not be lived, but there is no suffering of that life. Uh, and that's what's different between that and my views about climate change, where there will be a life being lived and there will be more suffering if climate change has gone on rather than if it has been uh, ameliorated. It's, it's interesting that you've brought up your views on overpopulation and knowing famine, affluence and morality, overpopulation approach is a really major evil. What are your thoughts on the antenatal movement? Do you think it can ever be morally wrong to choose to have a child? So, um, uh, the antenatal movement, I guess, suggests a couple of different things and not everybody may be familiar with this. Um, on the one hand, you, some people would use that term just for the idea that uh, we should have fewer children or the population of the world is already overpopulated and uh, people should try to reduce the world. That's a claim I think is largely, you know, depends on, on your view of the facts and your view of whether we're heading for climate catastrophe because we've got 7.6 billion people in the world now, uh, or whether you think that the world can support that population and perhaps a even larger population uh, over the next 50 years. Um, but there is also an antenatal movement, which essentially uh, is saying that uh, life on the whole is not a good thing, that uh, there is more suffering than there is uh, enjoyment or pleasure, uh, that um, suffering has greater moral weight than pleasure or happiness. Uh, and for those reasons, to bring someone into the world is uh, not a good thing to do in general. Uh, people who have reasonably good circumstances, even people who, you know, rather affluent, um, it still is not a good thing. Um, the philosopher best known with this, associated with this view is, is David Benatar, uh, who has a book called uh, Better Never to Have Been, um, and a more recent book called The Human Predicament that uh, sort of backs up some of the arguments of the earlier book. So if people are interested in that, I think it's an interesting argument. Um, I don't share that rather pessimistic view of human life. I think that uh, on the whole, most people are positive about their lives and um, uh, polls show that even in poorer countries. Uh, Benatar says, well, that's a kind of a, uh, something that's been implanted in us through evolution. If we were not positive about our lives, we uh, probably wouldn't reproduce or survive. Um, and he thinks it's a, it's a, it's a false judgment. Um, but I don't agree with that. I think that it's pretty hard to second guess people who are telling you that they, their lives are, are good and that they're enjoying them. So we've spoken a lot about this intersection of meat eating and climate change, but I think in the context of considering future lives, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the pandemic. Um, 
most scientists seem to agree that the origins of the pandemic do lie in meat eating and a lot of epidemiologists have now warned about the meat industry as it currently exists with huge amounts of antibiotics and factory farming. Do you think there's a possibility the pandemic is going to affect our meat eating habits? Do you think people might decide not to take the risk of meat eating or do you think we're going to have the paired consequences of future pandemics and terrible climate change in the future? Uh, I really hope that one consequence of the pandemic is that people will move away from meat eating. Um, and I know many of my vegetarian and vegan friends think that that could happen. I think that it's probably less likely than they do. I'm not saying it's impossible, um, but it will take, uh, again, a really concerted effort to do that. The, the problem is it's, it's a bit like climate change in that um, uh, it's a prisoner's dilemma sort of situation. So uh, I could stop eating meat, but if other people don't stop eating meat, factory farming will still exist. Uh, factory farmers will still give antibiotics to their animals. Uh, uh, bacteria will still develop um, resistance to those antibiotics. And I could still get sick from those bacteria. Um, or uh, the factory farms could breed viruses. And that's one of the things that experts have warned about, that you put tens of thousands of animals in a single shed, crowd them together, stress them, weaken their immune systems, and uh, it's the ideal breeding factory for viruses. Uh, and that's why a lot of people think that uh, we will be getting more pandemics. Uh, previous ones have come out of factory farms, maybe not uh, COVID-19, but uh, certainly the swine flu, uh, H1N1, uh, came out of factory farms, and uh, we could get many others as well. So I agree, I think this is now we recognize that this is an important reason, uh, an additional reason uh, for not eating meat. But uh, I, as I say, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's gonna happen. Um, to me, what's more hopeful is the development of meat-like products, which we're starting to see, both plant-based meat-like products and uh, not quite yet, but I think soon, um, cultured meat like products that is products that really are meat not just meat like but they're grown at the cellular level so no animal uh, was produced to produce them only only cells and this could be uh, very environmentally friendly uh, obviously not causing suffering to animals uh, and if we can really do that and replace a lot of meat economically that could have a big impact on future meat consumption. So I'm really interested here in your thoughts on plant-based meat or cultured in vitro meat. And I think I've got two questions here. Firstly, are you positive about the scientific advancement of these um, forms of meat catching up with the urgent need for us to stop consuming it? And do you think we'll be successful in encouraging emerging middle classes in countries like China and India to be persuaded to opt for these meat alternatives? Well, um... I'm not a scientist in this area. I think you probably should ask that question to people more uh, involved in the area. Uh, people tell me that yes, research is going ahead. They're making progress. Uh, the cost is starting to come down uh, with products that are already being made. And there are a lot of other ones in the, in the pipeline. A lot of money is going into this. So I think it's, it's definitely quite possible. Um, am I optimistic that we, people will take to it? Um, and you mentioned particularly China. Um, yeah, I, I think they will if it's uh, economical and uh, also if it's shown to be uh, safer, both safer in terms of what we just talked about, not producing pandemics, but also safer individually because it may not have uh, things like salmonella, which animal products often do. So uh, I think we could, and I, I think the Ch Chinese people are quite ready to uh, uh, try new foods. Um, they're famous for eating a, a lot of different things, some of which we don't eat. Uh, so I think if it's economical and safe and tasty, uh, they will do it. And I, I know that there are already um, plant-based meat-like products being produced in China. Um, the, the factories are already being set up and not just for export to Western countries, but for consumption in China as well. So I think it's interesting in your open remarks, you talked about the market demand for meat. And I think I perceive from that, there might be a sort of capitalism is necessary leading us to climate change. But do you think that with these new meat forms, we can reconcile capitalism and an opt for more economic um, plant-based alternatives? 
I think we can, um, and I, th I certainly hope we can, because if the alternative is uh, that we overthrow capitalism, I uh, am not optimistic about achieving that uh, within the time frame that we need to achieve carbon neutrality. So, um, you know, if anybody really thinks that capitalism is going to be overthrown within the next 20 years, I'd love them to tell me exactly what the path to uh, that transformation is because uh, a lot of people have been trying it for a long time. Uh, some succeeded, let's say, in the Soviet Union for a while, but not with great results. So um, I don't know exactly how we're going to do uh, that in, in that short time period. So I really am fascinated by your views on the pandemic. And obviously a lot of what you've been saying about me, it's been really vindicated in the last few months. But what do you think of the big moral lessons that we need to take as a society from the pandemic? You've already spoken, obviously, about the move away from factory farming and meat consumption. Mm. Mm. Well, actually, one interesting moral lesson, um, which maybe is sort of more for Americans than others, is um, uh, Americans have uh, traditionally had this idea that uh, they don't like big government. Um, they want government to be small and that they value their rights, the rights that they talk about from the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, that these are kind of sacred or absolute. Uh, and I think it's really interesting that when uh, it became clear or at least strongly recommended, I should say anyway, by the medical experts that in order to prevent the virus um, spreading very rapidly and uh, causing a, a very large number of deaths, uh, it would be necessary to essentially stay at home. Basically, really, you, you know, you could say if you want, uh, be under house arrest, more or less, um, uh, for uh, not only weeks, but months. Um, I think if you'd said that to Americans beforehand in the abstract, they would have said, no, you know, governments can't do that. We would challenge that in the courts. We would rebel against that. We have rights to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that can't be done confined within our own houses. So uh, governments don't have the right to do that. But in fact, the vast majority of Americans accepted that. There were some protests, but I don't think any judge, as far as I'm aware, um, ordered the lockdown rescinded um, because of a violation of basic rights. So I see this actually as a kind of a triumph for common sense utilitarianism, for saying, look, if, if the cost is high enough of giving people uh, rights to liberty, then we're going to have to, um, we're going to, have to restrict those rights. Um, and everybody will accept that if in fact, the only option is that they or people they love are going to die. So I'm glad you brought us on to lockdown. Obviously here in the UK, there's been a lot of criticism of Cummings for being perceived to break lockdown. Do you think it can be ever ethical to break the lockdown? Well, again, as a, as a utilitarian, I, I can't uh, say no, it can never be ethical um, because you do have to look at the consequences. Um, I think that we need to ask those questions. What, what are the consequences of breaking the lockdown? And uh, if it, you, know, you had to do it in order to save a, a, a sufficient number of lives, then that would certainly be the right thing to do. And I hope that people would recognize that and excuse it. Uh, the more interesting question, though, I think about the, the, the lockdown is um, how do we calculate the costs and benefits of the lockdown? Um, again, you know, utilitarians often get accused of saying, well, you know, you tell us to do what has the best consequences, but how do we know what has the best consequences? That's terribly difficult to calculate. And of course, utilitarians agree. I think that the best utilitarian answer to that is, yes, it's difficult, but would you rather just shut your eyes and, you know, choose Pull, pull, pull one policy out of a hat rather than the other with your eyes closed um, because you find it difficult to try to work out where the best consequences lie. Uh, and I think you know, most people would say, no, let's try to make an estimate. Now, in this particular case of, um, well, firstly, whether to go into lockdown and then when to end the lockdown once we're in it, uh, I think it's uh, people are recognizing that this is a difficult question of trying to weigh up the, the costs and benefits. And, and we don't really know how to do it because we haven't done enough research into what are the costs of the lockdown itself? What are the costs in terms of uh, people losing their jobs, uh, less income, uh, maybe uh, depression from being unemployed and being locked up at home, uh, 
uh, smaller economy, uh, small, less money for the government to spend, including spending on health services. Uh, I think we need more research going on to try to tell us in future uh, what are the costs of these kinds of changes and, and how do we weigh them against the costs of more people dying? I know I'm asking you still on a sort of utilitarian calculation in these questions, but I think so it's been brought up a lot is the question of how do we weigh at the cost of people wanting to go out and protest institutionalized racism and the suffering that has been caused by that and the consequence of the pandemic. Do you think it can be ethical to break lockdown to attend these protests that have been going on all around the world? Uh, yeah, it's another big question. And, you know, in a way we'll, we'll perhaps know the answer in about two weeks. Um, will there be a spike of more cases among um, people who attended the protests and uh, will they then spread to other people? Um, if there is such a spike, I think then it will have been a mistake. Uh, let me say at least it will have been a mistake outside the United States. I, I find it a little bit strange that these protests have been worldwide because what sparked them, of course, was this horrendous video of the Minneapolis uh, police officer with his knee on uh, George Floyd's neck, uh, Floyd saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and him continuing to do it beyond the point at which Floyd wasn't even moving. Um, so, you know, I can see um, Americans saying, you know, this is not the first time this has happened. We've had other videos going back several years uh, and this has to stop. And it's worth taking the risk of spreading the virus to stop this once and for all, when we've got this such a glaring and horrific case of this happening. And I hope that that will be right in that it will be worth it in that really serious change will happen. Um, uh, that's what would justify it. But in other countries, you know, here in Australia, there were protests, there were protests in the UK. Uh, in Australia, they tended to focus on uh, indigenous deaths in custody, which is a very serious issue. Um, but it's sort of, I guess, building off something that happened in America that has nothing to do with indigenous deaths in custody, really. Um, uh, and I think, on that one could have waited until we could more safely um, protest. Now, some people, you know, did wear masks, did try to socially distance. I think they were trying to do the right thing, um, but um, not everybody did. And as I said, we'll, we'll see in a couple of weeks what the results are. I hope that they won't be bad. So sort of two hypotheticals here. And let's say that um, we're talking here within America in two weeks time, there is a big spike in the virus and that spike is traced back to the protests. And alongside that, the sort of corrupt race institutions within the American police force aren't dealt with. Do you think then with the benefit of hindsight, you would argue the people that went out to protest weren't acting ethically? Well, um, when you talk about that, you can do this in two, two ways. You can say, given what they knew at the time they made the decision to go out and protest, was that an ethical choice? And then you can say, with the benefit of hindsight, do we now think that it would have been better if they hadn't done that? And on the hypothesis that you're sketching, then with the benefit of hindsight, I think we would say it would have been better if they hadn't gone out. But does that mean that we condemn them, that we say that they're unethical people, that they did something uh, that was you know, morally wrong? Um, no, not necessarily. That has to be something that we consider on the basis of what it is that they knew at the time and what they were trying to achieve and hoping to achieve. I'm sorry, I can't hear you now. Something's happened to your sound. Hi, um, sorry, I just wanted to wrap up on one final question and this is taken. Sure. Um, and this is, the question of how again it's weighing up sort of climate issues versus preference issues and someone asks um they did someone claims they take issue with factory farm plant-based proteins and argues that eating very sustainably and locally sourced meat would ultimately be better for the environment if we take this as a given um do you think we still have a duty to opt for plant-based meat um out of the preferences for animals uh i certainly do think that concern for animals is a major reason for uh, 
opting for plant-based food. But I do want to challenge that assumption. Um, it, it depends to some extent on what kind of meat you're eating, but um, the fact that you're eating locally is, is if, if say you're eating beef or dairy products, is pretty much irrelevant. I mean, it's, it's the animal producing the methane that really is the major contribution to climate change. And whether it produces the methane in your backyard or on the other side of the world makes no difference. The methane is going into the atmosphere. And the fact, you know, you might be saving a little bit of transport, but um, that's really minuscule. People have done the calculations. So the amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that come from the, the trucks or the shipping um, is minuscule compared to the amount that the animals themselves are putting into the atmosphere. Thank you so much, um, Professor Singer, for a really fascinating talk. I, for one, huge enjoyed this interview. And thanks to everyone that posed a question on the live stream. I think we've had a really enjoyable debate. So do subscribe to the Cambridge Union for more content like this and look out for our globalization and coronavirus panel tomorrow at 6 p.m. BST. Thanks, Lara. It's been uh, good talking to you. And thanks, everybody who asked a question. It's been good to hear your views as well. Bye.